For 13 years, the Western Conservative Summit has brought the nation's top conservative leaders to Colorado. Presidential candidates, members of the president's cabinet, governors, senators, members of Congress, influencers, media personalities, celebrities, and local leaders. More importantly, because the summit is hosted by Colorado Christian University, it is committed to education. Our workshops have educated thousands of conservatives on America's founding principles and how to address the most pressing issues facing our nation. The Western Conservative Summit Youth Conference has introduced the next generation of conservatives to Christ and the philosophical foundations of conservatism. We are preparing young leaders to take on today's ideological battles. In 2020, we couldn't meet in person because of the COVID shutdown. So we produced the film, America, America, God Shed His Grace on Thee, reminding Americans of their Christian heritage. Last year, six documentaries showcased the beauty and majesty of the Western United States while covering issues like the Second Amendment, Western energy, federal lands, and the rodeo. Now back in person, the 2022 Western Conservative Summit welcomes you to the Gaylord Rockies. In 2015, then CCU President Bill Armstrong admonished conservatives to mount their horses and ride. It was a call to personal action for our communities in the midst of our challenges. John Wayne once said, courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. Fellow patriots, welcome to the 2022 Western Conservative Summit. It's time to saddle up and ride. Please welcome the chairman of the Western Conservative Summit, Jeff Hunt. Isn't it great to be back? Yes, the Western Conservative Summit is back in person, and I am so excited to have you all with us. To the 2,000 registered attendees in person, welcome. For all of you tuning in from all 50 states, welcome. Welcome to an event that uplifts and proclaims Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Welcome to an event that loves America and supports our military, police, and first responders. Welcome to an event that supports the original intent of the Constitution and Western civilization. Welcome to an event that believes that you should judge a person by the content of their character, not the color of their skin, their gender identity, or the socioeconomic status. We are proud to be Americans. We are proud of our country's founding principles, and we plan to lead our communities. We are Western conservatives, which means we don't wait around for Washington, D.C. to solve our problems. We solve our own problems. We believe families with a mom and a dad are the bedrock of our society. We believe in parental rights and education and school choice for all Americans. We believe that life begins at conception, that every life is formed in the image of God and that government should protect the right to life. We believe in a strong military, strong borders, free markets, and limited government. We believe the church and civic groups are better equipped to serve the poor than creating a dependency class with government welfare programs. We believe in personal freedom and responsibility, and these are the basics of what it means to be a Western conservative. I hope you feel inspired this weekend. I hope you will be educated. I hope you will be activated. And I hope you will make a difference in your communities. So how does the Western Conservative Summit work? Well, we'll have three main stage sessions like this throughout the weekend each day where you're he you will hear from nationally renowned conservative leaders and sponsors. And then after these main sessions, we'll break up into workshops. We are hosting over 30 workshops this weekend where you can go deep on particular issues of your passion. And I hope you will take that seriously and go attend those workshops. We have an exhibit hall with nearly 50 exhibitors where you can connect with wonderful conservative organizations and meet candidates looking to serve you. Take advantage of every moment this weekend. That is my message to you. Take advantage. We need something like this, fellow conservatives taken a lot of beatings recently and to have a place where we can gather we can be proud of our country we can focus on the most important issues and then be activated to go make a difference take advantage of every moment this will be an interactive conference this year so please go ahead and pull out your cell phones go ahead and pull out your cell phones 
It's okay to have your phones out. Go ahead and open up your text message app and start a new message to the number 77007. From there, type in the word WCS, so to the number 77007. Type in the word WCS, and we'll be able to keep you in the know about all the things and activities that are happening this week at the Western Conservative Summit. Speaking of things that you can do, eventually on your phone you're going to be able to uh, vote on a straw poll or you can go over to approval voting's booth in the exhibit hall and vote for your candidates in a presidential preference poll and a senate and gubernatorial poll here for the state of Colorado. So out of all the candidates running for office, you can choose more than one. Who do you really prefer? We think that gives us a good insight into kind of trends and the types of activities and people that conservatives appreciate. We're also going to be asking you about issues. What are the most important public policy issues to you? This helps us determine speakers and issues for next year's summit. Speaking of issues, we are about issues this weekend. We are not about campaigns or candidates. Colorado Christian University is a 501c3 organization. So the Western Conservative Summit and its speakers are required to remain nonpartisan and may not endorse or oppose any candidate or political party for public office. The university will not endorse any statement made at this event by any person or organization that advocates the election or defeat of any political candidate or party. The only exception to this rule will be during candidate forums we will host for Colorado governor and Senate. In both cases, we invited candidates of Colorado's major parties to join us, and each candidate is given equal time. And as a reminder, CCU itself is not endorsing any of these candidates. Now, as many, of you as many of you are regulars, you'll probably notice that we are not at the Colorado Convention Center. We are grateful, <laughs> we are grateful to the Gaylord Rockies here in Aurora, Colorado for hosting us. I only thought it was appropriate that my good friend, Dustin Zivonik, city council member at large in Aurora, would welcome us to his city. Friends, please welcome Dustin Zivonik. Please welcome Aurora City Councilman Dustin Zabonik. Good morning. Hey, come on, let's hear it. Good morning. There we go. My name is Dustin Zabonik, and it is my great honor to welcome you to the city of Aurora and to the 13th annual Western Conservative Summit. Now, how many of you know the theme of this year's summit? It's got to be up here somewhere, right? It's time to saddle up and ride. This is a call to action, right? It's a call for all of us to enter the arena, to take a stand, to preserve and defend our values and our way of life. This call to action is exactly the approach that the new conservative city council here in the city of Aurora took after taking office last fall. In just six months, and I want you to remember, this is just six months, the newly elected council has restored a commitment to the rule of law We've rejected the calls to defund and demoralize our police officers. And instead, and instead, we've offered a comprehensive crime plan that seeks to rebuild our police department and that will crack down on, not coddle, criminals. We've passed a citywide ban on homeless encampments. We've cut unnecessary red tape and streamlined city processes. We've cut fees to make this city the most business-friendly city in the state. And along the way, we've reprioritized and refocused government spending at the local level to ref reflect the proper role of local government. That is what it looks like to saddle up and ride. As we look forward, all of us who are here today and this weekend have an opportunity and frankly an obligation to our children and to our grandchildren to ensure that our nation and government at all levels reflects our founding principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Nowhere have these time-tested values been more woven into our cultural fabric than right here in the American West. But unfortunately, and all of you know this, our values are under attack. Our conservative principles, our way of life are under attack. And these attacks are no longer limited to our coastal states or major cities. They're happening right here in our communities. We can no longer afford to sit on our hands and hope for the best. We must stand boldly and confidently ready and willing to restore hope before it's lost for good. And as we take a stand and we get to work, it's important to remember that the hope 
for our nation, the hope for our nation's future has never been found in government. It's never been found in Washington, D.C. It's always, from the beginning, been found in you, in us, in we the people. When this summit comes to an end, let's not forget this message and let's commit to each other that together we will saddle up and ride, that we will take a stand, that we will never waver in the struggle to secure our principles, those that made America one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. So again, thank you for being here. Welcome to the 2022 Western Conservative Summit. Welcome to the city of Aurora. Now let's ride. <laughs>
Please welcome Colorado Christian University's own Legacy Quartet. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the we watch were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Spangled banner yet wave O'er the land of the free And the home of the seated. So friends, let's begin this party today with a simple but important question. What does it mean to be a conservative? What is a conservative? We need a conservative revival, that we agree, but before we saddle up and ride, it would serve us well to clarify what this word means. After all, our middle name is Western Conservative Summit. And too often conferences like this, when you watch them, they begin with an entertainment marketing flair and then the unleashing of a devastating critique, attacking all those things we don't like, without ever saying what we're for. So the word conservative has a positive focus. It's about conserving. Conservatives are those who seek to conserve as opposed to those who are trying not to conserve but to revolutionize and overturn it all. And we've seen a lot of this in recent years, overturning the dignity of the unborn, overturning the family, overturning the definition of marriage, overturning biological sex, overturning free markets to embrace socialism, overturning constitutional protections, overturning parental rights, overturning free speech, overturning religious liberty, overturning the rule of law, overturning the American founding, overturning religious faith, and in education, overturning the humanities, the liberal arts, and Western civilization. Friends, the West, the Western world, is facing a massive cultural revolution in which the forces of anti-culture are sowing seeds of anarchy to destroy our cultural inheritance. And many of us are saying, enough, enough already. Ascendant Marxism, empowered by critical theory, seeks to upend the Western and American order. At the same time, political liberalism has gone to seed. It's morphed into a radical progressivism that has undone the foundations of liberty. It has ushered in a cultural revolution that's destroying everything in its path, disintegrating any sense of national unity, upending our history, ruining our families, eviscerating religious traditions, undermining the quality of education, we are in the midst of what some are calling a cultural catastrophe. And so at the beginning of the Western Conservative Summit, it will serve us all well if we clarify what it means to be a conservative at this hour, what we wish to conserve. And my key point this morning is that there is much to conserve. We need a conservative revival, a rediscovery of what it means to be a conservative. 
So again, I ask, what is a conservative? And sadly, many conservatives have a hard time answering that. Or they latch on to some micro definition that doesn't really cover it all. It's inadequate. For example, people say a conservative is someone who dislikes the left. True. Well, what does that mean? William F. Buckley, founder of National Review, said conservatism stands athwart of history yelling stop. Okay, but what else? Irving Kristol, in a more memorable definition, said a conservative is a person, a liberal, who's been mugged by reality. <laughs> I like that. Actually, conservative can mean different things in different cultures. In Britain, a conservative might be a monarchist. Or these days, someone who wants to move to the left, but just not as fast as the Labor Party. In Saudi Arabia, conservative will mean much different things than in the United States. In China, a conservative is someone who wants to preserve Mao's cultural revolution. Some people today describe conservatism as simply a mood or an orientation. Yuval Levine said that uh, conservatism is gratitude for what is good and what works as opposed to outrage for what is bad and broken. Russell Kirk said conservative is a one who believes in permanent things. Well, we're getting closer. Others identify conservatism with the classical liberal political position of our founders in 1776. Well, defining conservative is a lot more difficult than might appear. And it's complicated by the fact that there are different parts of the family. There are liberal conservatives, libertarian conservatives, paleoconservatives, social conservatives, fiscal conservatives, anti-communist conservatives, neoconservatives, and it gets quite confusing. The late philosopher Roger Scruton once explained his conservatism with a story. He said, I was in Paris in 1968 watching the protests from my apartment window, and I realized that building things of value like societies, and legal and economic systems and institutions is hard and takes time, while destroying them is very easy and often accomplished in a flash. He said it was then, at that moment, that I realized I was a conservative. In his brand new book, Conservatism, A Rediscovery, Yoram Hazoni offers a compelling account of what it means to be a conservative today. He says that being a conservative cannot primarily be about the pace of change. Rather, he says, it's both a way of understanding and a way of life that leads to human flourishing. I think this is helpful. First of all, conservatism is a way of understanding how we think about the world. But second, it is a way of life. It involves our actions as well. So what do we mean by a way of understanding? He and others, like Russell Kirk, have tried to boil American conservatism down to a handful of principles or canons of conservatism. So allow me to briefly identify what I think are six pillars of conservatism today. Pillar one, liberty. Conservatives believe that individuals possess the, life to, the right to life and liberty and property and freedom from oppression by government as well as the protection of government from outside oppression. For the conservative, freedom is super important, but it's not everything. Conservatives believe in an ordered freedom, an ordered liberty. Pillar number two, virtue, moral goodness. Virtue is necessary for freedom. Our system, capitalism, democracy, our republic depends upon self-government, people being able to govern themselves. So virtue is a necessary condition for the pursuit of freedom, just as liberty is a necessary component to the pursuit of virtue, freedom must be pursued for the common good. Pillar three, truth. Without truth, a nation perishes. The truth is what sets you free. And conservatives are interested not only in the accumulated wisdom of the past, as is often said, but also in timeless truth that corresponds to reality including the reality of an enduring moral order. Friends, if there is no truth, there is nothing solid to conserve and no compelling reason to conserve it. If there is no truth, there is nothing solid to tether our politics to. Standards keep shifting, everything's up for grabs, and so conservatives have been interested in conserving truth. Pillar four mediating institutions or foundational institutions that stand between the individual and the government, such as marriage, family, school, church, civic organizations. 
These structures are what make human flourishing possible and help nurture a conservative disposition. They must be given the freedom to thrive and re be respected by the government so they can carry out their important work. Pillar five, the rule of law. A government of laws and not men helps secure justice. Conservatives have a realism about the human condition. We believe it's important to have a legal system that's predictable, just, in which both the governors and the governed are subject to the same law. And this rule of law promotes prosperity and protects liberty. And then finally, pillar six, belief in God. And although some conservatives speak more gener generically about a transcendent order, but there is an ultimate ground for justice and virtue and truth and charity that transcends politics but sets the standard for politics. The state is not God. Let me say that again in our time. This is important for us to hear. The state is not God. It's subject to God. It's subject to God and that is why government must be limited. And so conservatives have a respect for religion, God, and the Bible, and the realization that we were not founded as a radically secular nation. Yet there is a belief in religious toleration to views that don't endanger the integrity and well-being of the nation as a whole. So these are six pillars of conservatism for today. And of course, that's not all that conservatives believe. I could mention human dignity free markets, strong defense, compassion for the poor, uh, the idea that in this world there are no utopias. However, for brevity's sake, I've enumerated six fundamental conservative pillars believed by most conservatives. But Yoram Hazoni reminds us that being conservative is not only about a way of understanding the world, it's also, and this is so important, about a way of life. Conservative beliefs and critiques of the left, they're important, but they're not enough. Hazoni says, we must live a conservative life. In other words, don't just be a political conservative, be a personal conservative. And he says, conservatism be begins at home. And if we ever overlook that, that dimension of a conservative revival, we may undermine everything else that we're doing. So what does it mean to live a conservative life? Hazoni, who is Jewish, not a Christian, is straightforward. And so he advises the reader, keep a Sabbath to preserve your soul. Return to church or synagogue so that you can nurture your faith. Preserve the lifelong bond of marriage between a man and a woman. And read the Bible, he says. Now these are his words, not the words of an evangelical pastor. And I might add that if we ever hope to restore the social and moral foundations of our society, if we ever hope to rebuild the culture where it has crumbled, then we must become a lot more intentional about having children and passing on this way of life to them. We must hand down the tradition to the next generation. And for families, this means mealtime conversations, educating them in faith, morals, and manners, teaching music, reading to them, telling our nation's stories, planting gardens, raising animals. But it also means supporting institutions that nurture a conservative disposition. It means turbocharging the growth of alternative schools, charter schools, the classical school movement, faith-based schools, and universities where there is still a commitment to hand down the Western spiritual and intellectual tradition, and of course, supporting schools like Colorado Christian University. They need your support. But friends, contrary to popular opinion, conservatism does not necessarily coincide with one political party. These days, some think it's identical to the Republican Party in the US or the Tory party in Britain. But when those parties go with the flow and promote big government and runaway deficits and reject fiscal discipline or reject constitutionalism or go wobbly on social issues like the sanctity of life or are no longer willing to argue for lifelong marriage between a man and a woman, they are not conserving what is fundamental to human flourishing. And when they give in to raw power and malice or completely overlook the importance of character, they are not being conservative either. So we at Colorado Christian University acknowledge the limits of conservatism. American conservatism is a political philosophy and as such it is a, hear me, partial philosophy of life, describing 
how a system should be ordered, the best way to order that system. But conservatism is not the gospel, just as um, the America that I, I love is not the kingdom of God. And Christianity, of course, is much bigger than conservatism. While I'm a political conservative, I am first and foremost a Christian. Nevertheless, with Hazoni, who is Jewish, I believe that the conservative way of understanding and a conservative way of life, as I've outlined it, do lead to human flourishing and is what we need. And so, friends and fellow conservatives gathered today at this cultural moment, at this critical moment, we need more than the usual political strategies that we've tried in the past. Simply railing against the left is not enough. Hazoni calls his readers to actually, quote, repent and return, unquote, to something more basic, to not only be clear about what it means to be a conservative, but to rediscover it and then to live it out. And you know what? I can't help but think that he is right. I can't help but think that we have work to do and that this is the conservative revival that we truly need. Thank you very much, and may God bless America. Please welcome 710 K News radio talk show host, Matt Dunn. Lieutenant Colonel Alan West is a Christian constitutional conservative, combat veteran, and former member of the United States Congress. He is the third of four generations of military servicemen in his family. During his 22-year career in the United States Army, Lieutenant Colonel West served in several combat zones and received many honors, including the Bronze Star, three Meritorious Service Medals, three Army Commendation Medals, and a Valorous Unit Award. In 1993, he was named the United States Army ROTC Instructor of the Year. In November of 2010, Allen was elected to the United States Congress, representing Florida's 22nd District. He is the author of several books, including Guardian of the Republic, An American Ronin's Journey to Family, Faith, and Freedom, Hold Texas, Hold the Nation, Victory or Death, and We Can Overcome, an American Black Conservative Manifesto. In July of 2020, Mr. West was elected chairman of the Republican Party of Texas by an overwhelming majority of state delegates. West is an avid distance runner and has already gotten in his four miles this morning in our high altitude. I am impressed. We were just chatting. He is also a master scuba diver. Not missing much there. Uh, in his spare time, he enjoys cheering his beloved Tennessee volunteers with uh, another fellow named Peyton Manning, I am sure. Colonel West is married to Dr. Angela Graham West, a financial advisor. They have two daughters, Aubrey and Austin, and he is also the proud grandfather of grandson Jackson. Anyway, if you add all of that up, a common theme there is courage, and we need an awful lot of courage today. Please welcome Lieutenant Colonel Alan West. Please welcome American politician and retired military officer, retired Lieutenant Colonel Alan West. Thank you. Thank you so very much, and it's a pleasure and an honor to be back here on the stage of Western Conservative Summit. And uh, I just got to say one thing. Someone needs to write a better bill so we can get more oxygen up here. Uh, it's kind of struggling at 5,500 feet, but that's okay. You know, being here today, what's the whole task and purpose? Because that's really what you have to understand. When I was a commander in combat, I would tell my soldiers every single day that you must understand your task and purpose. And right now, if you're saying that you're a conservative in the United States of America, you must understand your what and your why, your mission, what you need to do, and the purpose for the reason why you're doing it. Because right now, as it said in the book of Esther, for a time such as this, 
There is no coincidence that each and every one of you are here in this moment, in this time. And I recall back in October of 2008, when there was a young senator who was running for president of the United States of America, and he said that we were five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. And so many people stood up in Columbia, Missouri, and they clapped and they cheered, and they were just excited about this fundamental transformation. But no one questioned, no one asked, first and foremost, what are we transitioning from and what are we transforming to? And that's what we have to understand today as conservatives. Because in this moment in time that we are in the United States of America, I think it is less about Republican and Democrat. It is less about political party formation. It is more about ideology. And when you think about where we are in America today, it is about an ideology that is rooted in our fundamental principles and values because there is no other nation like the United States of America, a nation that was established on the premise that says that the individual is sovereign and that government exists by the consent of those government. And the key thing that we have to realize is that if we don't have respect and regard for the individual, their rights, their freedoms, their liberty, their sovereignty, what we see happening today is a progressivism, a socialism, a Marxism, a communism, a statism that does not believe that the individual is the supreme entity in these United States of America. They don't believe that God with the big G is the one that grants your rights and freedoms. They believe now that the government with the little g is the supreme entity. And so following the president of Colorado Christian University, I'd like to further expand what it means to be a constitutional conservative, what it means to be on this ideological battlefield against progressive socialism, because that's what we are facing today. And we have to be able to go out and clearly delineate the differences between these two philosophies of governance, one that established the greatest nation that the world has ever known, another that has never been successful in anywhere in the entire world, but yet it has creeped, crept into this incredible nation. So when you talk about the comparison and contrast between constitutional conservatism and progressive socialism, the very first thing we have to understand is that, as I just stated, constitutional conservatism sees the individual. They understand that you're the preeminent entity. When you look at the Declaration of Independence, when you look at our Constitution, it establishes that. No other nation in the world says that the individual gets their rights, the inalienable rights that come from the Creator God, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Of course, if you study John Locke, it's life, liberty, and property. If you have read Frederick Bastiat and the law, it is personalities, liberties, and properties. But those are all the individual rights. But what does progressive socialism do? Progressive socialism only sees the collective. Maybe some of y'all remember the old Star Trek Next Generation with Captain Jean-Luc Picard, and you remember the enemy that he had to face sometime called the Borg. The Borg never saw individuals. The Borg only saw you as a number within a collective organization. And the Borg always would say that resistance is futile. Assimilation is your only way to go. And that's exactly what the progressive socialist left sees. They don't see you as an individual entity. They only see you as black. They only see you as white. They only see you as whatever grouping they can create. And that's what cultural Marxism is doing in the nation right now, trying to pit us against each other, trying to make us believe that we are something that we are not, a bad nation, a racist nation. How is it that a young man like me can be standing before you today if America is still a racist nation? <laughs> Constitutional conservatives believe in the economic empowerment of the individual. It means supporting you. It means the right type of tax policies, fiscal policies that enable small businesses to grow, which is the backbone of our free market economic system. But what does the progressive socialist left believe in? They believe in economic empowerment. When you think about the Great Society programs of Lyndon Baines Johnson, one of the things that destroyed the black community and the black family 
was Lyndon Baines Johnson, Great Society Programs. Lyndon Baines Johnson created economic enslavement. And let me tell you something. There are two ways to enslave people. You can work them for no pay, or you can pay them for no work. And there was only one political party that has done both of those things in these United States of America. And I think we know who they are, because it is about enslaving the individual. When you're going to the gas pump and you see those prices, when you're going to the grocery store and you see those prices, when you have someone that is standing up and saying that we're transitioning, an incredible transition, away from energy independence to energy dependence, all because they are pushing this agenda that economically enslaves you. My one-year-old grandson, I would have never thought that I would be in an America where we would be searching around looking for baby formula. But that's the situation that we have now. Because economic empowerment means economic independence. Economic enslavement means dependency. And progressive socialists want more Americans to be dependent upon them. And that's not the way. That is not what I took an oath to support and defend in this great nation. <laughs> Constitutional conservatives believe in the equality of opportunity. Let me tell you a simple story. On February the 7th of 1961, I was born in a blacks-only hospital, Hughes Spalding Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. But somehow I rose up to become a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army to command a battalion of 600 in combat. That I rose up to become a member of the United States House of Representatives and represented the highest per capita income zip code at that time, which was Palm Beach Island. Yes, Mar-a-Lago was in the district that I represented. Yes, Rush Limbaugh was in the district that I represented. Yes, Ann Coulter was a constituent of mine. That's equality of opportunity. That says that no matter where you're born, no matter where you come from in the United States of America, you can rise to whatever heights that you want. But the progressive socialists believe in an equality of outcomes that would tell a young man born in the inner city of Atlanta, Georgia, the exact same neighborhood that produced Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., there's only so far that you can go. There's only so much that you can attain. And when you look at what is happening in our inner cities, when you look at how the left has decimated the family. See, when I was born, even though born in a blacks-only hospital, 77% almost of my generation being born at that time, we had mothers and fathers in our home. But today, thanks to the progressive socialists, it's only 24%. And see, I find it very interesting that the left never talks about the decimation of the black family, the traditional nuclear family. They never talk about the rise of the gangs and the violence and things of that nature. But when you tear down the family, and even when we think about what has happened in Uvalde, Texas, when you kick God out of our schools, you invite the devil in. And that's what we see happening. Constitutional conservatives believe in our national sovereignty. We are these United States of America. We are the longest running constitutional republic that the world has ever known. But progressive socialists don't believe in that. They believe that America is just a piece of land in between Canada to the north, Mexico to the south, the Pacific, and the Atlantic Oceans. And that's why we see millions upon millions coming across our border illegally into the United States of America. That's the next generation of people that they will seek to economically enslave because it's all about them maintaining power and control. I find it very perplexing that anyone would want to run and be an elected official, be a president, be a senator, be a member of the United States House of Representatives, but yet they hate the very thing that they're called to serve. How can you be the president of the United States of America and supposed to uphold our Constitution, when every single day you're violating that Constitution. See, constitutional conservatives, we cannot stomach that. And we must stand up and we must fight for our national sovereignty. America is a special place. And I've been to 13 or 14 different countries, and I can tell you that nothing beats the land of the all-night 7-Eleven, Denny's, Waffle House, and Whataburger.
Constitutional conservatives believe in our constitutional rights and that the Constitution of the United States of America is a restraining document on the powers of the federal government. As a matter of fact, when you read the Constitution and understand it, in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, 18 things. 18 things are listed as the duties, responsibilities, enumerated powers of the government. And our founding fathers were so brilliant when they put in that 10th Amendment, all the powers not delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states and to the people. That's what we believe in, that the power in the United States of America is not up there in the federal government. It's not at Washington, D.C. It's at our state level. It's at our local level. It is with our people. That's why I tell you the most important elected position that you can run for in the United States of America is school board because that's how you determine the future and the legacy of this great nation. But the progressive socialists don't believe in the Constitution. They don't believe that you have the freedom of religion and the free exercise thereof. You just saw Coach Kennedy. They believe the churches should be shut down at their whim. They don't believe you have a freedom of speech unless it's acceptable speech. They don't believe you have the right to petition your government for redress of grievances. They don't believe that every person in the United States of America has the right to keep and bear arms that shall not be infringed. If they can do what Justin Trudeau is doing in Canada right now, they will seek to do it here in the United States of America. Our founding fathers understood by putting the Second Amendment there in our Bill of Rights because an armed individual is a citizen. A disarmed individual is a subject. And one of the first things that socialists must do is to disarm a population in order that they can have totalitarian and tyrannical control because the left believes in ideological rights based upon their ideological agenda. They believe that you have a right to murder a baby in the womb. They believe that they have the right to decide about marriage. They believe that they have the right to undermine the omnipotence and the omniscience of God who created man and woman. Now we don't even know what a woman is. And you can sit on the Supreme Court and not know. You ain't got to be a doggone biologist to know the difference between a man and a woman. The left's ideological rights cannot supersede our constitutional rights, but that's exactly what they want. But the most important thing I want you to take away is that constitutional conservatives believe in making victors. That's why this is the greatest nation that the world has ever known. That's why people come to these shores. That's why people will get in rafts and boats and leave Cuba to come here. That's why people who lost their country in Vietnam came here. That's why people left Eastern Europe to come here, and they still do. But we want them to knock on the front door and come here legally, not come through the back door. But what progressivism, socialism, Marxism, communism, statism, what they believe in creating is victims. That's the greatest delineation between who we are as conservatives and who they are as leftists. Victors or victims, and choose for yourselves today. Let me close by just telling you the philosophy and principles of my ideological mentor, a man by the name of Booker T. Washington. If you have never read his autobiography, Up From Slavery, you need to read that as a conservative. Booker T. Washington is the founder of black conservatism. And what was his three-point plan? Education, entrepreneurship, and self-reliance. That's our message to go out and spread all across the great United States of America. Education, not indoctrination. Entrepreneurship, not sitting at home waiting for a check, and self-reliance, independence, and not dependence. That's what makes us constitutional conservatives, and that's what makes America the greatest nation the world has ever known. God bless you all. Thank you. Please welcome Colorado Christian University student and CCU for Life president, Daria Nichols. Hello. As president of CCU Students for Life Club, our next speaker is a personal hero of mine. 
Kristen Hawkins has been president of Students for Life of America since 2006, and since then she has built up a small organization of a few dozen student groups into a coordinated national team serving more than 1,220 Students for Life chapters. Before launching Students for Life, Ms. Hawkins served at the Republican National Committee and as a presidential appointee in George W. Bush's administration at the Department of Health and Human Services. Recently, she served on then-candidate to Donald Trump's Pro-Life Advisory Council. As a, a published author, frequent speaker on national news programs, and a regular speaker at pro-life conventions and events across the United States, please join me in welcoming Kristen Hawkins to the Western Conservative Summit. Please welcome the president of Students for Life of America, Kristen Hawkins. You know, I believe there are moments, decisions that are made in every movement that determine the fate of the cause. It comes down to a choice that is made often by one or a few to lean back or fall forward, to take a personal risk or play it safe, to play nice and you know, make friends with those in power or create the tension needed to demand real change. Think about the, a moment for Mother Till. Emmett's mother, who decided to leave her baby boy's casket open, which led Rosa Parks to think about why she was giving up her seat on the bus and why she refused to give up her seat that night, which began the Montgomery bus boycotts, which led to four students walking into a lunch counter in Greensboro and refusing to get up from the lunch counter. Friends, I'm here today to ask you to do something that's never been done in the history of the world. I'm here to ask you, the American church, to join, to join with the pro-life generation to put our nation back together in a post-Roe v. Wade world. I'm here to implore you to help us achieve our mission that has thus far spanned five decades to move it from Washington, D.C., to state by state, to city by city, to church by church, to make abortion an unthinkable and un unavailable option. I'm here today to ask you to make a decision for life, for millions of lives. And this isn't simply a rhetorical question, it's serious significant. Quite frankly, it's time to saddle up and ride. For the past several months, my family and I have been traveling across the American South. And in every town, you know, the history that we go through causes me really to pause and reflect upon the tragedy our nation experienced in slavery and the Civil War. And as I conduct interview after interview about the leaked Supreme Court decision that signifies that as of February, five justices voted to finally right the egregious wrong of Roe v. Wade, I continue to be asked about what that will mean, sending the decision of abortion, abortion legality back to the states, what that will mean for the future of our nation. During these conversations, I can't help to think back to what happened after our Civil War, the Reconstruction effort, a topic that's rarely discussed in our culture or history classes. It's failure. And finally, the civil rights movement in America that finally saw success 99 years after the surrender at Appomattox. For decades, black Americans lived with regular discrimination and Supreme Court sanctioned segregation and fear of night rides of the Klan and those in authority who simply look the other way. And through our own inaction, the most powerful institution in our nation, our church permitted it to go on. It was in solitary confinement in the margins of a newspaper that Martin Luther King wrote to white clergymen, explaining the price of inaction and pleading for action. He wrote, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in a stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, who paternal 
realistically feels that he can set a timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time, who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding for people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute understanding, misunderstanding from people of ill will. He went further, though, to say, there was a time when the church was powerful. It was during this period that early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat, a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. But things are different now. The contemporary church is so often weak, ineffectual voice with uncertain sound. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consumed by this church's often vocal sanctioned of things as they are. If the church of today does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early Christian church, it will have lost its authentic ring, forget the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as a relevant social club with no meaning. Sadly, it took a hundred years from the end of our Civil War until the passage of the Civil Rights Act to achieve what Martin Luther King deemed a positive peace. It took the murder of a little boy named Emmett in rural Mississippi and then his murderer's acquittal that led to one woman refusing to give up her seat, which led to marches in the streets, freedom bus rides, student-led lunch counter sit-ins, which resulted in days and weeks in jail, stinging pain of water hoses, death threats, bombings, and assassinations. Friends, it took 99 years. The hour is nearly upon us that we have all worked for. Some of you have been working for before I was even born. Step one of our mission Step one, which was reversing Roe, will be complete. But we have so many more steps to go. And the American church must rise. And you must lead it. We cannot, we cannot tolerate decades more to reconstruct our nation, to put back together what the Supreme Court broke in 1973. Make no mistake about it. The battle that is coming in the next few months will be physical, political, and spiritual. In our city streets, the violence that so many support behind the closed doors of a Planned Parenthood will be committed openly and justified by many in power. In state houses, those who we've worked to elect, who've pledged to stand with us, will be forced to finally act. They will be casting votes to determine the fate of abortion laws, the fate of millions of lives in their state. And I predict some of those who said they were with us won't be there when the final tally comes in. In our homes, our daughters and our granddaughters will be ordering chemical abortion pills shipped from overseas to states that may have banned abortion, but these pills will come right to her or to her friend's house and they will result in injury, infertility, and possibly her death. She'll be aborting her child in her bathroom and returning to the scene of the crime every morning when she brushes her teeth. In our workplaces, men and women will be hurting from past abortion decisions, made to finally reckon with a choice that they might have made decades ago. In our church, what will we be doing? Will we simply be a thermostat or a thermometer? A thermostat can transform our society, or a thermometer just reflects it. I believe it's not too late for us to stand and be a thermostat, but this relies on each of us, each of, each of you who are in this room. First, today I'm asking you to commit to compelling your church to act. Talking to young people about the predatory abortion facility in your neighborhood. Convincing your pastor, which only 6% have given a sermon in the past year on abortion. Convincing your pastor to have the courage to speak. 
to start a ministry for post-abortive men and women who are hurting in your church, for women and families in crisis who need help right now. The first step I would encourage you to do is join Standing With Her Sunday on August 28th, a national simulcast with groups like Turning Point Faith and Support After Abortion and Family Research Council, Students for Life, who are getting together to arm the church to stand with her in a post-Roe era. The second thing I would ask you to do is envision what your community, what your city, will look like without abortion. Ask yourself what you, your church, what your business must do to help ensure that women and families in crisis can be connected immediately to those who can help them. And don't be afraid to think big. You know, when I launched Students for Life 16 years ago, newly married, just turned 21, I remember the uh, often very well-meaning suggestions from many of my mentors who said, we love your passion. We love the excitement of going to college campuses to intercept young people from the predatory abortion facility. But you know, reversing Roe versus Wade, becoming that post-Roe generation will never happen. And you need to be careful about saying that because it makes people think you just aren't in touch with reality. I challenge you to remember who it is we serve, the creator of the universe, what he has and can do through us. And finally, be a messenger. Quell the flames of fear that Planned Parenthood is sending down to this generation. Show them, and I know I probably shouldn't say it's a conservative event, the progressive view that we have for our nation, that it is 2022, not 1922. No woman should ever have to choose between the life of her child and her education or career goals. We are actually the progressives. They are the regressives in this fight. Tell America about the 3,000 pregnancy resource centers and more than 400 maternity homes that vastly outnumber the fewer than 600 abortion facilities in our nation. Know the resources that are available in your community. You can go to standingwithyou.org supportafterabortion.org, ab abortionpillreversal.org. Have those sites ready. This is fundamental. This is fundamental. This year, Students for Life and our team, we've knocked on more than 120,000 doors right here in Denver and 19 other cities. In neighborhoods surrounding abortion facilities, 73% of the neighbors we speak to don't know all the nonviolent alternatives that exist in their community. They have no clue that the pro-life movement for 50 years has been starting, supporting, and sustaining an entire social apparatus. Friends, when the Supreme Court finally reverses its anti-science Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Doe v. Bolton rulings in the next few weeks, this month, what decision will you have made? What course of action will you take to determine the fate of this movement? The greatest human rights struggle in the history of our world. You know, in the course of um, my family's travels this year, I've been honored to take my kids to Appomattox, where the Civil War ended, to the battlefields in Gettysburg and Vicksburg, which were the keys to Union victory. I've shown them an old mansion uh, down the road from where I grew up that was the last stop on the Underground Railroad in what was Virginia at the time. I've been to Montgomery, where Ms. Parks refused to give up our seat, took the kids to the lunch counter in Greensboro, where the students refused to vacate. And in every history uh, homeschool field trip stop, I asked my children what they would have done if they think, if they would have had the courage to do the hard thing, to make the hard decision, to stand for vulnerable others facing injustice. But now, I no longer have to look back into our history and ask those questions of ourselves because history is happening right before us. Today, will you make a decision to seek a positive peace, 
to stand for innocent children and alongside their mothers and families. Getting to work to ensure that in a post row America, no woman stands alone. Or will you simply embrace a negative piece? For me, my family, the pro-life generation, which is active on nearly 1,300 campuses, has more than 150,000 trained alumni. For this generation that I have the honor to lead, I can absolutely tell you, we will seek the positive peace. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Weber, CEO of AMAC, and I want to personally invite you to join AMAC and become a member of the fastest growing mature conservative membership organization in America. Our strength is in our members, and it's people like you who are saving the America we love. But AMAC is more than just talk. We are getting things done. AMAC members pushed back against woke Disney, taking over 150,000 advocate actions sent to Disney executives and board members. These people seek to push their radical, progressive agenda on our children, and AMAC members won't let them. AMAC members made their voices clear with over 400,000 emails sent to the Senate including to Manchin and Cinema, this was a real grassroots effort which resulted in the defeat of dangerous H.R. 1, the so-called For the People's Act, a hostile attempt to take power away from the states and federalize our elections. AMAC is centered on American values, freedom of the individual, free speech, and freedom of religion. We defend the sanctity of life, uphold rule of law, and offer benefits at all levels. AMAC plays a vital role in helping build the services that helps enrich the lives of all Americans, especially those 50 plus. Through the AMAC Foundation, anyone can engage with our no-cost social security advisory services. AMAC's accredited advisors are highly trained, helping members understand the risks, the benefits, and the timetables, especially at a time when you need it most. In 2021, AMAC expanded its News and Opinion Analysis Division. AMAC's website is full of original content and breaking political news that you won't find anywhere else. The AMAC News app is free to everyone where you can stay connected when you're on the go. AMAC membership includes your subscription to the bi-monthly AMAC magazine and AMAC's National Medicare Advisory Services provides members with real-time assistance with Medicare guidance, where highly trained certified agents offer personalized service and choices to meet your needs. Plus, when you join AMAC, you'll save money on everything from travel, lodging, roadside assistance, and so much more. In short, by joining AMAC, you become part of an energetic and focused conservative alternative to the other 50 plus organizations. This is your chance to do well and good at once, protecting our future and assuring that we pass forward a strong, healthy, and well-grounded America for generations to come. We invite you to join AMAC today. Visit us at amac.us for more information. Thank you, and God bless America. Please welcome the president of AMAC Action, Bob Carlstrom. Well, hello, my fellow members of the right-wing conspiracy. It is so great to be among you again. Uh, though all of us who Hillary loves to hate, we're all together again, and it's so nice to be back here you know, at the Western Conservative Summit uh, in person and not virtually. So thank you all for coming and, and thank you for, to the Western Conservative Summit and uh, uh, for uh, inviting us and permitting us to be here. We heard some wonderful uh, speeches and discussions by Dustin, Dr. Sweeting. You know, he talked about all the definitions of conservatives. You know, we probably have more definitions today of gender, you know, as I listen to uh, to the news. Colonel West was always terrific, and Kristen 
always moving, and, and, and thank you for that. And I'm, I'm glad you got to meet our CEO of AMAC Inc., uh, Rebecca Weber. She's the daughter of our founder. She runs the company and some of our other companies, and so, uh, so glad to be here with you all. Um, this is a very, very critical time, you know, in our constitutional republic. And, uh, uh, and what we as conservatives have is a mission to save our nation and to save our republic. And I wanted to ask you, how many of you are members of AARP? Good. Uh, how many of you are members of AMAC? Yay. I wish all of you were members of AMAC. But anyway, we're, we're um, AMAC, which stands for the Association of Mature American Citizens, um, is the largest conservative alternative to AARP. We have about 2.35 million dues-paying members, you know, and we scrub it every week, so it's not an inflated number. And more and more people are joining us because with AMAC, People who are conservatives now have a genuine choice with more and better benefits than, uh, than AARP offers. I also want to point out to you uh, two of my colleagues that are here, uh, Andy Mangione, if you could stand, a senior vice president, and also Jennifer Bankston, my vice president for operations. I have to remember to use this clicker. Um, in terms of uh, the kinds of media that AMAC offers, uh, we have Rebecca, who you just heard from, does a podcast uh, several times a week with uh, different conservative leaders, members of Congress, and others who have much to offer. And we also do twice daily public affairs updates to our members. We do weekly updates uh, with Ben Ferguson, as well as some of us as, as spokespeople. And, and we, of course, we have the magazine and the AMAC app. And I urge you to go to our, uh, to our uh, exhibit booth and see the magazine first off and all of that and join us. And I would say also, too, that in benefits, we've got better benefits than AARP has. You know, in terms of Medicare Advantage, you get 10 choices, not just one, to feed their leftist lobbying, or Medicare Supplement, five choices health and life insurance, financial planning, and all of that, and you get an individual, you're not put in a pool. You know, and, and Rebecca talked about the foundation, which is extraordinary. They're averaging about, uh, about 750 to 1,000 calls a week from Americans, not necessarily AMAC members, say, what do I do about Social Security? And all kinds of questions, and another book is coming out on that. And I would urge you to go to the AMAC Foundation site, particularly if you have questions, and reach out about your Social Security. When should I take it? You know, my spouse passed away, what are my options here? All those kinds of things they'll answer for you. There's a Medicare report, there's a weekly Social Security report, there's, there's um, webinars as well. So our purpose here is, is also an AMAC, uh, AMAC action, is the C4 advocate uh, affiliate of AMAC, is to really to be an ever-growing and effective national grassroots network. All politics is local. And, that, and to provide a vehicle, an advocacy vehicle, for conservatives who really want to engage and support them. So many people complain, but they don't know what to do about it. And, and so that's why I would urge you to join with us you know, in AMAC and AMAC action and become a part of the conservative force that's intended and focused on saving our Constitution and our Republic to restore uh, our, our Republican representative democracy, and to always protect faith, family, and freedom. In sum, you know, we need to protect our national heritage of freedom and liberty for our children, and grandchildren, and successive generations. That's what we're about. We're just not an old people's organization. We represent all Americans, but particularly those over 50 plus. And I would say to you, if you plan on living to be 50, you're also eligible to join. So, and, and it's expensive. It's $16 a year. That's two lattes. So, 
cut down on two lattes for a year and you're in. So, that, so it works that way. And our other purpose is to really to counter and defeat the multifaceted legislative agenda you know, that seeks to erode our constitution and our republic. We are in the fight. We're in the fight in Washington. We're in the fight in the states. You know, we really resent their efforts to divide Americans on the basis of race or ethnicity, to control and restrict your God-given inalienable rights, you know, in the pursuit of happiness. And so we're there. We're front and center. And so we, we, you're welcome. We'd love to have you join us. We also are working with the other conservative organizations, such as Heritage Action, which is here today as well. And I think you'll hear from Kevin Roberts, uh, who heads Heritage Foundation tomorrow. But our key issues have been election integrity. We've been engaged in so many of the states in terms of uh, enacting legislative reform, you know, to restore the integrity of that. Um, I'm really having to whiz through these things because I'm running out of time. In health care, we have a bill that was introduced, uh, again, this Congress, to provide pro bono health care for phys physicians for Medicaid-eligible families so they can have a, a, a physician-patient relationship and not have to go to the emergency room. And it saves billions of dollars with the charitable deduction as opposed to the thousands of dollars that would otherwise be paid out of Medicaid. Uh, other issues is Article 5, is, is stop the runaway spending. We need a constitutional amendment that puts a direct limit on what Congress can spend. We have a $30 trillion plus national debt, which is outrageous. People in Congress say, gee, we have control. We don't need the states to do it. Well, what they're doing is they're wrecking the states and they're wrecking our people and they're creating a debt. And constantly, the Constitution needs, needs to specifically address and put a box around them. And so we've been engaged in many states with many people and our AMAC members overwhelmingly say, it's time. The state's got to step up because remember, the states are the primary unit of government in our republic. Our constitution is structured so that the federal government's powers are limited and defined. And that needs to be dealt with and, that, and the states need to step up. And in AMAC action, our volunteer, we call it the AMAC Army, they step up, they go meet with their state legislators, many of them know them, uh, and, their, and their congressional representatives in their, in their district offices because there's no power politically like constituents raising the alarm and raising the concern and telling, telling their members what they need to have done. We do meet and greets with them, we reach out to them all the time, and I know that I'm really over time now, and so I'll conclude with that, but please stop by, you know, at our, uh, at our booth over in the exhibit hall. Rethink and join AMAC. $16 a year. We'll finance it at a buck and a quarter a month with no interest if you need to. But anyway, you should be in it. All of you should be in AMAC. We're, we're 2.35 million. We should be 3 million by the end of the year. We should be 4 million. We should be 10 million. And AARP needs to be over on the left side entirely. And conservative Americans need not join it. So thank you very, very much for your attention. God bless. And God bless America. Please welcome the president of Judicial Crisis Network, Carrie Severino. Hello. Well, I am so excited because I feel like this term, every time I'm here talking about the court, I am the bearer of good tidings. Obviously, um, you, uh, we, there's been a lot of news in the court this year. Uh, we have some turnover on the court. That, that probably isn't good, uh, good tidings. That's going from uh, Justice Breyer, who is a reliable liberal vote, but at least a kind of moderate one, to uh, soon to be Justice Jackson, who I think will be a knee-jerk uh, vote for the left every single time. Um, however, when you look at what's going on in the court this year, the other big news, of course, is this leak. Now, again, there's parts of this that are bad news. It's really bad news. We have people working within the Supreme Court who can't be trusted 
to be professionals and not leak confidential information. Uh, when I clerked at the court, you couldn't leave the building with any piece of paper like that decision that got leaked. It would have been outrageous to even have a leak of the, the vote lineup in a case the day before it came out, let alone an entire opinion months before. But I'll tell you the really exciting news. The opinion that we saw leaked last month shows that we have a majority of the court that actually are committed to enforcing the Constitution as it is written, including in one of the most high profile and longest fought issues in this country, Roe versus Wade. That is an, accus an incredible accomplishment. And for all of you who have been active, whether it's in the pro-life movement or particularly within a tr the movement of trying to get justices on the court who are going to be faithful to the Constitution, I want to say thank you because this is a term that we are seeing so much fruit coming from those efforts. Uh, I clerked for Justice Thomas. It's his 30th year on the court. And when you look at the contrast between his first term on the court and that, incidentally, was the term that Planned Parenthood versus Casey was decided. That was the case that walked right up to overturning Roe and then blinked. And then actually reignited Roe, rewrote that, you know, Roe itself rewrote the Constitution. Casey then rewrote Roe versus Wade's rewriting of the Constitution. It was an, an example of judicial activism at its finest. To this term, 30 years later, when on so many issues, Justice Thomas has gone from being the lone dissenter or close to alone with Justice Scalia alone by his side, and now we have a majority of votes in the Supreme Court on so many issues. So that's going to be issues like abortion, but also uh, the defense of the Second Amendment. Get ready for a major Second Amendment case that I think is going to go really well coming down, dealing with New York gun laws. Get ready for some great decisions in the religious freedom area. We're going to hear from Coach Kennedy next. I keep on wanting to call him Coach K because I went to Duke, but but for Co Coach, so go Duke. But but. We have great news coming in that. There's another religious freedom case coming out called Carson versus Macon, which also looks like it's going to go well. It has to do with Maine that had a voucher program that they wanted to just exclude religious schools from. You could, you could use your voucher for any school in the state, public or private, as long as it wasn't religious. And, and it was even worse than that. It, it could be a church-affiliated school, but they couldn't actually be teaching religion. So it, it's, it's pretty egregious what people try to get past the court, and now we finally have a court that's willing to function as that constitutional backstop to make sure that the shenanigans that are happening, whether it's the Biden administration trying to weaponize the courts to get, its, get, get to do its work, uh, you know, on the eviction moratorium, on vaccine mandates, et cetera, or whether it's the states trying to do that in the case of Maine, we have a court that's operating as that, as that backstop. I do want to talk a little bit in particular about Dobbs, because I think that's the case everyone is watching the most this year. First of all, I mentioned a little bit, what happened with this leak? This is an outrageous um, violation of norms at the Supreme Court. I'm excited to see that, though it has taken four weeks, and I'm not sure exactly why, Chief Justice Roberts is starting to uh, put the screws on the clerks. And we all think this is probably a clerk, and probably a clerk from one of the liberal justices that leaked this opinion, right? And we've, we've heard that now he is asking clerks for their cell phone records, asking clerks to sign affidavits to say that they didn't have anything to do with this, um, this leak. And that's really good news. The person who, who perpetrated this leak needs to be called out, needs to be punished, because what we have seen, and I, I, have, I have six kids at home, if, and, I, and so this is what I've learned from raising a lot of toddlers in my time. If you don't, if, you, if, if bad behavior is rewarded, you're just going to get more bad behavior. And what we have seen with the court in so many ways is bad behavior has been rewarded. People on the left trying to weaponize the court to get their goals achieved has been rewarded. People trying to intimidate the court, and let, let's be clear, that's what this leak is about. It's not, it, it was clearly about trying to stop the court from doing the historic work of setting the Constitution right when it comes to abortion. That's uh, what they were trying to prevent. They were trying to trigger what we've been seeing now, people shouting at the houses of Supreme Court justices, people picketing. You know, as these people's kids are coming home from school, they have to walk a picket line, you know, to, while, while uh, people are shouting lewd and, and, and horrible things through these, uh, these private neighborhoods of the justices. The implicit threat, even against their own safety, 
uh, that's going on here uh, against the justices. That is what the goal of this leak was, and it's part of a pattern of intimidation we've seen against the court. From, from the leaks, we've seen it from attacks uh, in the press, we've seen it from attacks from even our senators. Senator Schumer, who remember a couple years ago, the last time the court talked about abortion, stood on the steps of the Supreme Court building, shaking his fists at the justices, pointing at them, saying, I'm talking to you, Kavanaugh, I'm talking to you, Gorsuch, if you go through with this decision, he thought they might be doing something, you know, to, to roll back Roe versus Wade a few terms ago. He said, you won't know what's hit, what's hit you. And now they're trying to bring that to pass. Even seeing some of the, uh, the types of intimidation that's happening with the threats of court packing. Believe me, that's, that is a threat against the court because everyone on the court, everyone in Congress really as well, knows how dangerous that would be for our Supreme Court to have it turned into even more of a political football where every time the shift of power in, in D.C. changed, you might add more justices. This year it's going to be 12, 9 to 13, and then we get 15, and then we get 21. Eventually you're going to have to build, you know, annexes onto the building to fit all the justices. That would be horrible for the court, and that's what they're threatening if the court doesn't rule the way they want. We have one senator, Senator Whitehouse, who filed a brief in a case a couple years ago, effectively saying that if you don't rule my way, we're gonna pack the court. And that's the, the threat that's always being held out against them. So where are we on some of these major decisions? There's 33 decisions left and only the month of June to go. That means the court, if they're gonna get these all out, they're gonna have, have to have a couple decisions coming out every day starting next week. And we know there's gonna be decisions coming down on Monday. It's gonna be a wild and crazy ride. We're gonna have a lot of people saying fake things about what this court has done and fear-mongering about it. Don't, don't listen and don't believe it. If we, if, if we have an opinion coming out the way that Justice Alito's draft said, which is what I, I, I still think is the most likely a thing that happens. I don't think you're going to see the justices fold under pressure precisely because, you know, they know, they've had toddlers too. They know you can't give in to this kind of thing. Um, then we're going to see a lot of people saying things like, this is going to prohibit abortion around the country. It's not. This is going to mean that we undo Brown versus Board of Education. That's ludicrous. This is going to mean that Loving versus Virginia and anti-miscegenation laws are now back on the books. That's completely ludicrous. You know, so there's a lot of, of threats that are going to happen. We need to make sure we're clear-headed in talking about what this decision actually does. Those of you who are involved in the pro-life movement need to make sure that we now realize the focus is going to have to be on protecting them both, protecting women and children, providing options, providing a safety net, and then taking that fight back where it really belonged this whole time, which is in the legislatures. The state legislatures, the federal legislature are all going to have a lot of issues to deal with surrounding abortion if the court determines, as, as the Constitution requires, that this is not something that's dealt with in the Constitution. Uh, that doesn't mean it's going to be pro-life laws all the way down. We're going to have some states like Texas and Georgia. We're going to have some states like California and New York. So it's going to be a wide range. Uh, but this is the opportunity to talk to people, change hearts and minds, and that's ultimately the way our legislation is going to get changed. There are going to be really important issues coming up dealing with uh, mail order abortions that I think the, probably the federal government's going to have to even address uh, because there's shifts to that. In trafficking in women, people are saying Colorado itself is going to become this you know, abortion tourism a destination location. I think we need to really think about, you know, is this, is this something, the legacy we want for our state and how can we uh, work on those issues? We're going to have to look at state courts. You know, the Roe versus Wade was the big, a big national decision that took it out of the American people's hands. Every state court has the potential to have a mini Roe and to read into their state constitution words that are not there. We know some states have already started doing that, like Kansas recently. So uh, that's, it's, it's time to focus on making sure we have state judges that are just as committed to the constitution as our Supreme Court uh, state justices are. But I'm, I'm excited to say that there is a lot of hope. We have a, a justices this term that have, I think we're going to see a lot of great cases out of. Next term, we're going to have really significant issues coming out, including Har uh, a case that involves Harvard and whether racial preferences in education should be allowed. Spoiler alert, they shouldn't. Um, and a, a case it dealing uh, kind of along the lines of the Masterpiece Cake Shop, dealing with whether an individual who designs websites can be forced to use their design authority and, and, their, and their creative design power to uh, design websites that violate their, their religious beliefs and their strongly held beliefs. So keep watching. I think there's a lot to be excited about, and I want to thank you all for what you've done to help make sure we have judges faithful to the Constitution. Keep up the good work. Thank you.
Please welcome Colorado Christian University student Hannah Kudesny. As special counsel for litigation and communications and briefing host for First Liberty, a nonprofit law firm, Jeremy Dice is dedicated to defending religious freedom in the U.S. Mr. Dice obtained his law degree from West Virginia University College of Law in 2005, shortly after graduating from Taylor University in 2001. Mr. Dice furthered his education at the American Studies Program in Washington, D.C., where he interned with David Organ Coolidge as part of the Marriage Law Project of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. After law school, Mr. Dice clerked for the Honorable Russell M. Clodges, Jr., Chief Judge of the 17th Judicial Circuit in West Virginia. For six years before joining First Liberty, Mr. Dice led research and advocacy efforts on matters of life, marriage, and religious freedom. Please welcome to the stage Mr. Jeremy Dice. Please welcome Special Counsel for First Liberty Institute, Jeremy Dice. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for having us here. And thank you to Hannah and the wonderful students here at Colorado Christian, the Western Conservative Summit. What a great morning this has been for all of us and for me especially. I bring you greetings from the great state of Texas and my boss, Kelly Shackelford at First Liberty Institute. Uh, if you don't know anything about First Liberty Institute, let me just tell you one thing about it real quick. First Liberty Institute is the nation's largest law firm dedicated exclusively to defending uh, religious liberty for all Americans. That means we defend religious liberty when you go into the military, when you go into the public square, when you go to school, and when you go to your houses of worship. We believe that if you've had your religious liberty questioned by the United States government or any of its parts in the country, you shouldn't have to pay an attorney to get them back. And so we've, got, we've come to the defense of men like Coach Joe Kennedy. Now, you know Coach Kennedy, you've seen him earlier this morning. Uh, coach Kennedy was a football coach, and I say he was a football coach because for doing what you see on the screens behind me, he lost his job. Now, before I bring him to the stage, I'd like to just take a few minutes and have you watch a real quick video about Coach Kennedy to learn more about who the man is. Bremerton, Washington is a blue-collar town built around the Navy shipyard. This is the field where our client, Coach Joe Kennedy, took a knee for a silent prayer. The school district fired him for that. A lot of people hear the, the prayer thing, if you will, the, the football game and the kneeling at the 50-yard line and all that, and they may make the assumption that you're a preacher's kid. <laughs> it's not exactly true, is it? No, quite uh, the opposite. I was really one of those uh, trouble to use. Uh, I, I was a bad kid. I, one of the kids I wouldn't want my kids hanging out with. What do you think set you off so much when you were so young? I don't know. I don't know where all that kind of anger comes from. I mean, it seemed like everything was fine. I mean, I was mischievous, but I mean, things didn't get bad until it was right after my parents told me that I was adopted. You know, me and my sister were adopted, and we both came off the rails right at that point. I don't know, eight, nine, or ten, somewhere in there when I was a kid. I, I needed a place to stay. I didn't have, I was homeless and no place to go, pouring down rain. So I walked my way up here to the church and I knew that churches are a good, safe place to actually go. And it was all locked up in the middle of the night. So I kind of jimmied the door open and walked in, and it was probably the most terrifying night of my life. Uh, all wood and candles burning and shadows and it was probably the spookiest place on earth. I mean, what are you going to do when you're 10? I mean, where do you stay? As a coach, Joe sometimes saw his younger self in the eyes of each player. And it, it breaks your heart. Somebody has to reach into these kids' lives and, and be there for them. So that was really how I saw those kids. It was like, there's the chance that I could reach out and help these kids become something. So they didn't have to go down the roads that I went down. Now, Joe's silent prayer in Washington State is being heard in Washington, D.C. One last question for you. Was it worth it? Absolutely. Not, no doubt in my mind. I would do everything all over again. Because if people don't stand up and fight for what they believe in, I mean, what's the point? Why, how could I have been a coach if I told kids to give up if it got hard? or you know you're going to lose, or it's going to cause you some pain. 
So just quit? No, I would have been, I couldn't coach, I couldn't be that guy. So, yeah, absolutely. If anything, it shows the kids that, hey, you fight until the end. It doesn't matter what the score is, but you never stop fighting. So let's bring him out, Coach Kennedy. Please welcome Coach Kennedy. All right, so what we thought we would do this morning in the few minutes we have left to spend together here is just to get to know Coach Kennedy and what his case was all about. You may be surprised to learn that that full story didn't come out in the media over the last couple of years that this lawsuit has been going on. So. I thought I'd ask a few questions that I've thought, boy, I really wish the media would report on the answers to these questions because it would set the stage for what this case is really all about. So coach, you've, you've done a few interviews, so you know a couple of these questions already, but um, tell us about the commitment you made uh, way back, what is it now, almost 15 years ago you made this commitment. What was that commitment and did it involve anybody else? It, it really was when I was a brand new baby Christian, I had no idea what I was doing and God called me to be a coach and I was ill-equipped and not even qualified for it. So I was watching uh, Facing the Giants. I don't know if anybody's seen that movie, but I was, yeah. But boy, that, I mean, their budget was like $26 and look how much impact it had on my life. It, it, it answered the question I, sh I was going to, you know, yeah, I will coach. I'm, I'm going to be all in God. And just like in the movie, I was going to give God the, the credit, win or lose, right there on the battlefield. And that's what I did. It, that's what my commitment to God was, was to just give him thanks after every single game. And that didn't involve all the students. I mean, over time, students started to join you. You said it's a free country. But when push come to, comes to shove, does that involve praying with the students or not? No. I. I it, when they started coming up, I, I, I know that I did the prayer this morning and my heart was beating just crazily because I, I'm not a great prayer. And to pray in front of all these kids, I, I don't know what to say. It's just thank you, God, for these guys. So I actually prefer to pray alone. I, I, there's no pressure there at all. So in the school district, they did an investigation based on a compliment, oddly enough, from an opposing school district. They do this investigation, find out you're praying on or with or near students, and they ask you to stop. And you stop. You, you, you stopped that then, and you never went back to praying with students. But you did continue to pray by yourself. And the school district still had problems with that. And they said, first, it's going to take away from your job responsibilities after the game. Because, you know, 15 to 30 seconds on and in private prayer takes a lot of time away from picking up helmets, apparently. Uh, but you said, okay, wh whatever, that, that doesn't seem to make sense. They said they gave you two alternatives. One, you could go across the field, up two flights of stairs, across a practice field, into the main school building, down the hallway, and into a private office somewhere, and you could engage your prayer, prayer over there. Or, they said, you could go across the field, up two flights of stairs, across the practice field, outside of the stadium, down the sidewalk, back in the side gate, up a flight of stairs, across a catwalk, kick everybody out of the press box, and you could pray there instead. Those didn't seem to work out very well for you. Why not? Well, one reason, I mean, they were absolutely ludicrous. I, my job is to supervise these young men and to make sure they get from point A to point B. Now they're telling me I have to completely leave the field of battle with these guys and go completely into a different part of the school. And that just wasn't feasible. It made absolutely no sense for me to leave my guys. And secondly, what kind of message would that send to my team if, you know, here I am wanting to thank God and, oh, ha I have to go hide it and, you know, be ashamed of what I'm doing and, oh, you know, religion's a bad thing. We don't want anybody participating in it. I just think it was a horrible message to send to the kids. So the school district is made up of people that were your friends, right? You've got coaches, you've got the superintendent, who's one of your closer friends. Uh, so things were trying to be worked out, but then the lawyers got involved. And, and lawyers are pretty great people, I think. Nope. But uh, apparently the lawyers got involved here for the school district, and they've suggested uh, from the beginning and really more at the Supreme Court here that, that, um, that students felt coerced to pray with you. In fact, they've even trotted out a couple parents that said that a couple students felt uh, coerced, that they objected. Is that true? Did some students object? What happened to those kids? 
it, it was interesting from the very beginning. I, I never wanted to, you know, do anything bad to my team. The last thing I wanted to do was, you know, put any pressure on my kids. They got enough pressure growing up today. And football fields should be where they can, you know, have a place that's free from any kind of pressure. Only thing they need to do is just go smack the other team around. So the whole idea that I was uh, coercing them was really just mind-boggling. And I had to question myself over and over. Did I? Have I ever done that? Have I ever put anybody in that kind of position? And I, I challenged all the media, you know, the, the, every single person that brought that up. I said, find one kid, please. Find one that says that and I'll agree with you. The people that, um, it's a small town and these kids are, they're really part of my life. So I, I watch them grow up. And the last thing I wanted to do was to have them, you know, feel weird about coming to, to me and talking to me. I had two of my guys over the years, and they came up and said, Coach, I don't want to have anything to do with the prayer. And I'm like, all right, well, what do you want to do? Well, I'd like to take care of the football team that doesn't come out and take care of the equipment and make sure everything's good to go. Awesome. It was never a problem. That, that's really cool. Matter of fact, both those young men, I made them my team captains because I love their leadership. They could stand up and say what's on their mind. So, yeah, wasn't... They weren't uh, coerced or anything. If anything, I, I was rewarding people for not coming out. So. <laughs> so this started, you made that commitment to coach football after serving 20 years in the Marine Corps. Uh, the athletic director, you tell this story, spends about a year trying to convince you to, to coach. Uh, you hadn't played football. You were, what, four foot something in high school, so you couldn't play football. You'd get hurt. Uh, you played with the, with the bone crushers in the Marine Corps. It was about as, as well as you could play there. You decide to coach football. Um, you spend those seven or eight years doing what you did and the whole process became this thing until 2015. And then we got the investigation, the prayer by itself, you, you stopped praying with the kids and all that. Uh, in the midst of all that, uh, we get involved and we file a lawsuit on your behalf. The HR director for the school district happens to be someone very close to you, it's your wife. And so we end up suing your wife. Um, do not do that, ever. That, that's my advice to anybody in here, do not sue your significant Unless you other. want some periods of intense fellowship at home, yeah, right? intense yeah. fellowship. So we, we, we sued the school district, we, we go to the, the, the district court, then the Ninth Circuit, then we go to the Supreme Court, they say go back, so we do that whole thing again, we get to the Supreme Court on April 25th. It's now been almost seven years since you were on the, on the football field with your guys. We're going to find out by the end of the month what this case is, is all about. The justices are going to issue their opinion before they go on summer recess. We're going to find out if Kennedy versus Bremerton School District stands for the prospect of religious liberty or not. So the question I think it was asked in that video, which we shot probably three months ago, looking back on it, seven years, would you do it again? Has it all been worth it? Absolutely. Absolutely 100% worth it. And I, I'll, I'll be lying to you if I said it was a cakewalk because, yeah, suing my wife was one thing, but it, I mean, my kids went to the high school. I had two, um, my, my daughter and my middle son, they were actually attended the school. And I was ripped away from my football team that I loved more than probably even my own kids because I've spent so much time investing in them. And that is, investing in our youth, there's nothing there's nothing on this earth that is more rewarding than helping these people not go into the, you know, the follow the footsteps that I fell into and getting in trouble, you know, being locked up, uh, being sent in and out of um, boys' homes and, you know, the whole foster system is, is kind of broken these days. And I didn't want anybody to have to suffer like that. And I, I felt like that was my calling. It was something that I really enjoyed doing. And I was so blessed to be able to be part of their lives because you're only in their life for a very, very short time. And it was just ripped completely away from me. Well, Coach, any time you could have walked away from this whole thing and no one would have thought a second about it. You could have done exactly what the school district asked you to do. Uh, you could have just gone into the press box and you know, hidden in the corner, do all these things. But a certain part of our freedom, all of our freedoms, and especially our first freedom, religious liberty, would have died in that press box with you. So on behalf of Americans everywhere, I think it's appropriate for all of us just to give you a great word of thanks for sticking up for this whole thing over the last seven years.
Thank you, guys. I'll just end with this. In the coming weeks, we're going to get this opinion from the Supreme Court. And I, want to under, I want everybody to understand how important this decision is. Depending on how this case comes out, the school district here has said that if, if students can see adults like Coach Kennedy engage in a private act of religious activity, what they call demonstrative religious activity, if they can see that teacher doing that, that's enough to violate the Establishment Clause. That would be establishing a religion, apparently, by, to, for them to be able to. So this is coercion by sight. So if a student can see a teacher praying at the lunch table, that could be a violation of the Constitution and cost that teacher her job. If a teacher wore a crucifix around her neck or they wore a hijab or a yarmulke, those are all demonstrative religious activities that could constitute grounds for termination for each one of these, these teachers. If that is what the Establishment Clause means, then our freedoms that are talked about in there are all but dead. In 1969, the Supreme Court said that it can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights when they walk through the schoolhouse gates. We're going to find out at the end of this month if that promise remains true or not. Shockingly enough, at the Supreme Court, the other side actually argued that it wouldn't even require state action to violate the Establishment Clause. That's a fancy way of saying that if he's out at the Waffle House and students could see him praying over his waffles, that could be enough to violate the Establishment Clause and cause him to lose his job. Folks, as long as we are on the job at First Liberty Institute, we're not going to let that happen. I want to encourage you to go to CoachKennedyFacts.com and learn more about Coach Kennedy. Coach, thanks again. Hey, one real quick thing um, as I'm walking off because I know my time's up, but I want to thank every one of you because, you know, it, it feels like you're on a windy corner all alone, but when I get to come to these things, I see what America's really about, and I see the people that are out here fighting for the exact same thing I am. So thank every single one of you for being right alongside me in this battle. God bless you all. Welcome back, Jeff Hunt. All right, I'm going to be real quick here. How was that Friday morning session? Was that good? We're just getting started. Some very important announcements, so don't leave quite yet. Okay, we're going to start workshops in about 15 minutes down to the right in the Crest and Summit Room Hall. So make sure you go there. You should have a list of those workshops in your uh, check-in packet there. Secondly, anyone heard of the movie, uh, What is a Woman? Yeah, okay, so Matt Walsh is going to be here for our Friday afternoon session. Now, due to security concerns, everyone's going to be checked, wanded, and bags checked at that door, so you don't want to be late for the afternoon sessions, okay? That's going to be back here at 1 o'clock. Thank you all so much. God bless you. Go enjoy the workshops. We'll be back this afternoon. <laughs>